I want to share with you our vision of the Army 10 years from today. The Army of 2028 will be ready to deploy, fight, and win decisively. The Army will do this through employment of modern manned and unmanned ground combat vehicles, aircraft, sustainment systems, and weapons, coupled with robust combined arms formations and tactics based on a modern warfighting doctrine and centered on exceptional leaders and soldiers of unmatched lethality. Mr. President, tomorrow I'll be headed back home to Austin, where on Friday I'll be attending the activation ceremony for the new Army Futures Command. The establishment of this command, which began operations last month, is the most significant Army reorganization since 1973. So what does the Army Futures Command do? How does it fit into the existing organizational structure, and why is it necessary? Well, let's start with what it does. It seeks to modernize the Army, period. So the Army Futures Command is really the hub of modernization efforts for the Army. It takes new concepts from the realm of the abstract, and it puts them to use concretely in the form of real-world technology that the Army can acquire for its own purposes. Then it helps the war fighters implement and use these new tools in the field. Greater use of autonomous systems Robotics and AI promises to make our units more lethal, our soldiers less vulnerable, and the Army far, far more effective. Of course, we already use robots in the military in a limited way, with unmanned aerial vehicles as most commonly known. But the scope of robots in military operations is not yet widespread, and that is likely to change in the very near future. And we are likely, very likely, to see the increased use of robots in ground operations as the technology matures. The weapons that are on the way from Germany to Belgium to reduce these forts are the best example I can think of to show how much has changed since the last time the great powers fought each other in Europe 100 years before. In nowhere is that more on display and evident than in artillery, which a hundred years ago during Napoleon's time was already what Napoleon thought decided battles. I mean, he was a guy who made his bones in the artillery. He rose through the ranks as an artillery officer. He's known for its use on the battlefield. Here's a guy that, that could shock people with the killing power of well-used artillery, and his big guns were firing 12-pound cannonballs. 12-pound cannonballs. The gun itself weighed about 1,200 pounds. It's the same gun, essentially, in, in one case that both sides in the U.S. Civil War used, about a 1,200-pound about a cannon. The gun that's on its way and the guns that are on the way from Berlin to Belgium weigh the largest, weighs almost 300,000 pounds. 1,200 pounds to 300,000 pounds. The shell that Napoleon's 12-pounders fired were between 9 and 12 pounds. The shell that this monster, the 420-millimeter version of it that's on the way, that shell is 2,000 pounds. The Napoleonic-era cannon that was so deadly at the time that you know, it was shocking had a range of effective range of about 2,000 yards. This weapon on the way to Belgium, which isn't even designed for range at all, it's a siege cannon, so it doesn't even have to fire very far, has seven times the range of that French cannon that was designed to shoot far. This is an entirely new kind of warfare, and the people who actually see this gun once it's assembled are slack-jawed. The wonderful world of science and engineering is going to take over the battlefields of this upcoming conflict in a way that has never happened before. And this weapon to me most symbolizes in this early part of the war, you know, your example of here's your wake-up call. Here's your Darth Vader. Here's what 20th century warfare is going to mean. A soldier of 1865 could not imagine a soldier of 1918, even less so a GI of 1945, or a grunt of 1965. That was pure science fiction to the Yank or Johnny Reb. Rapid change, however, 
has become increasingly compressed, especially in the last 150 years. And I would submit to you that those of us today will find it difficult to recognize the battlefield of 2035. In that quarter century period of time, will be fundamentally different than what we see today and will likely have in the few years ahead. Think of the difference between the smoothbore musket and the rifle, or the rifle and the machine gun. The difference between muscle power of foot soldiers and horse cavalry and the machine power of tanks, trucks, and airplanes. Think of the shift from guidons and flags and drums to the telegraph, telephone, and radio. Think of observation to the limits of the human eye to the introduction of the radar. The shift from sail to steel and steam. The shift from dumb bombs to smart bombs. In short, the ways and means of war is, in my view, about to undergo fundamental, profound, and significant change. And think of how much things had changed from Napoleon's time to the 1880s. This was a 19th century world discovering the horrors of 20th century warfare, and they were going to have to learn how to deal with this new reality one horrific, bloody lesson at a time. We know that robots are coming on very, very quickly in the commercial sector, and they're likely to have significant military application. Now, if you read between the lines and you eventually see the document we will be publishing here in, in several weeks, you'll find that be, there's a great deal of emphasis on technologies such as hypersonics, AI, robotics, directed energy. That is all the basis. Those technologies form the basis of this future force. Of course, we already use robots in the military in a limited way with unmanned aerial vehicles as most commonly known. But the scope of robots in military operations is not yet widespread and that is likely to change in the very near future. And we are likely, very likely, to see the increased use of robots in ground operations as the technology matures. In fact, my Russian counterpart has publicly set an objective that one-third of the Russian military, military will be robots by 2020. That's in four years. He may not actually achieve that goal, but his intent and his direction is clear. And finally, finally, there is the mother of all technologies, artificial intelligence, where machines are actually developing the capacity to learn and to reason. There's lots of ethical and moral issues associated with all these technologies, and especially in their application to warfare, but there's no doubt in my mind that the combination of geopolitical, societal, natural, economic, and technological change is rapidly converging in time and space and will likely result in the most significant and profound change in the character of war we have ever witnessed throughout all of recorded history. Greater use of autonomous systems, robotics, and AI promises to make our units more lethal, our soldiers less vulnerable, and the Army far, far more effective. It will also allow us to fill more capacity with greater capability. This will be the Army of 2028. This is why modernization is our third major line of effort. It is a vision fully consistent with the national defense strategy, and one that General Milley and I believe will ensure our overwhelming success for years to come. No one's been beaten very hard yet in this story. The Belgians are but an appetizer to what modern warfare is going to be like. Modern warfare between the great powers on the planet, the first experiment in this hypothesis of beating the violence out of societies, is on the way. If war is an addiction to the human species, what's about to happen is the first dose of shock therapy to see if we can be cured of it.